All right. Well, hey, hey, friends. Welcome to another episode of the Hero Makers podcast. And uh, and we're getting to the end of 2020. Uh, are you are you happy about that? Are you sad about that? Or are you just like neutral? You don't care? You know what? This is as bad as this pandemic has been for our country, for the world. Yeah. You know, oddly, this has been a great year for me. <laughs> no, uh, that is. And you guys, that's our guest. That's actually our guest, Darian Cockrell. <laughs> We're going to find out why 2020 was awesome. We are going to, yeah, yeah, which is amazing. But hey, Darian, thanks for kind of like chiming in there. That was amazing. Oh, I thought, <laughs> I thought you were talking to me. Your eyes were looking, okay, I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry. no, it's awesome. I love it. Hey, and I'm so glad you're on the podcast. And so anyway, personally, see you never 2020. That's all I got to yeah, say. <laughs> so we so we have two different, very different opinions going on. <laughs> but um, so, and I'm really excited to have Darian on the podcast today because, okay, so Darian, I have to tell you, my mom was a teacher. So she was a teacher for, I want to say like 30 years, something like that. Mm-hmm. And oh my goodness, like the, the amount of influence that she had over like so many students. I mean, every year, I remember this, every year, like at Christmas time, it was like the funnest thing because all of her students would give her, you know, like the apple ornaments and all of that. And she would let us help her unwrap it. And I always felt like she was so loved. I'm like, oh man, like I wish I was that loved. It's really, so I'm really excited to talk to you because I think teachers are like just the, the most amazing thing. And, and you, Darian, okay, so I saw you, it was an article in CNN, I was reading the other day, and I saw that you won the Missouri Educator of the Year Award. So woohoo! Woo! And, I, and I, so I reached out to you because then also I read a little bit about your background. And here on the Hero Makers podcast, we talk a lot about people who have overcome obstacles um, to kind of get where they're at and who are now just really impacting other people and who are um, helping to elevate people and to realize their gifts and their skills. And that's you. So you're, I'm giving you that title along with Educate of the Year. You are also a Hero Maker. So that's um, our title. It's not even honorary. It's like I'm giving you that title. Thank so you. welcome to the podcast, Darian. Thanks for being on with us. Thanks for having me on. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah. And you are coming to us from S- St. Louis, but are you like downtown or are you in a suburb? So I'm in a suburb. I'm in uh, Baldwin, Missouri, which is about 20 minutes out from St. Louis. Okay. All right. And what is the weather like in December right now in St. Louis? Uh, you know, it's crazy because last, last week we had like a day, a couple of days where it's like 60, but then today it's like 30. So oh. Louis, we're known for our roller coaster weather in right. any time of the year. Okay. But it's so, super cool right now. Okay. So we're, I'm in Chicago. Anne is in Toronto. Um, and so, but I feel like Chicago weather is maybe a little bit similar to St. Louis weather. So, yeah. My, my uh, wife's best friend lives in Chicago. She lives in Powell Time. Oh, yeah. Summer, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I know it's really cold there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> it's all relative, I guess. Like when you live here all the time, you're like, whatever. It's, <laughs> but, um, but Darian, we're gonna, you know, I just want to talk to you about, we just want to talk to you about your story, um, where you came from, the people who kind of walked alongside you along the way, and then just like what it's like to be an educator and why you, why you do this. And like, you're going to tell us about some of your great students too. But um, t- start off with just like, tell us a little bit about your history, your growing up, um, your childhood. And um, yeah, just give, give us a little background on, your, on yourself. So born and raised, uh, city of St. Louis. My grandmother raised me uh, because my grandma or my mother was addicted to drugs, so she couldn't raise us. Uh, my father uh, died when I was four years old, so he was. I never had a relationship with him, so he was never around. Obviously, uh, my grandmother struggled to take care of us just because of finances and just the lack of resources and things like that in our neighborhood. And it got to the point where the neighborhood was so bad and where our living situation was so bad that. I was actually taken away from myself and my siblings. We were taken away from my grandmother when I was like six or seven years old. And uh, we were put into foster care. So we bounced around homes for a little bit. And then once my grandmother kind of got a better grasp of, you know, living situation and just a better place for us, um, she found us, you know, through the state and uh, through the system. And she uh, put me and my siblings back together and she took care of us. Uh, even though she did her best to take care of us, uh, it was still hard, obviously, because I was still doing things that I probably shouldn't have been doing at that age. Uh, but it was just one of those situations where while she was out there 
trying to, you know, be a grandmother, trying to work and make a better life for us. When she wasn't around, we were just out with friends and just doing crazy stuff in the streets. So, I mean, at the time when I was doing those things, it was normal. You know, that was all I knew. But now looking back at it as an adult, obviously those things weren't okay. I shouldn't have been doing those things. And, you know, I would never want any of my students to have to go through any of that type of stuff. Mm. But with that said, it got to the point where as I got older in my education and I started to become closer with different educators, those relationships started to build and I started to become a little bit more comfortable enough with them to let them into my life and let them know what was going on. Uh, that was good and bad. I guess bad for my family because the stuff that they didn't think anyone was finding out about, people were finding out about. And lucky for me, uh, because my counselor knew that in order for me to be successful, I did not, I shouldn't have been in that environment. Like if I was gonna be better in life that I needed to get out of the environment because no matter what they try to teach me at school, no matter how good the situation was at school at the end of the day, I had to go back to that same situation. So it's just kind of hard to focus at school when you know when you go home, you might not have food, you might not have water, and lights might be off. There's all those different things you have to worry about other than just doing homework as a kid. But it got to the point where my counselor was start, she started to go to my social worker and tell her all this stuff that I was telling her. When I would come to school crying or hungry or dirty and things like that, she was relaying all that information back to my social worker. And one day I came to school and my social worker was there and they said, you're not going back home. And literally since that day, I have not lived in the city. So they actually ended up putting me in the boys' home about a mile uh, away from my middle school. And then my counselor got, um, I don't know the name of the guardianship that she got, but I was living at the boys' home, but she was allowed to pick me up every day from the boys' home, bring me to school, and then take me back to my boys' home. Um, and can I ask you, Darian, like how, how old were you? You said middle school, so around- no, middle school, I was 13. Okay. I was 13 years old. And uh, so the summer, so uh, so I went into a boys' home when I was in seventh grade. And then that summer leaving up to eighth grade, out of the boys' home, I started playing football for my middle school. And that's when I met my middle school football coach. And he had a son as well. And he had a daughter. And I became uh, pretty close to his son just through being in the same couple of classes and playing football together. And uh, there were a lot of times where I wasn't able to, to do activities outside of football because – I lived in a boy's home and I just didn't have those, um, I didn't have anyone to take me to do those things because the only person who had a guardianship of me was my counselor. And unfortunately doing that, those weekend games and things like that, she had a life of her own, she had other family. So outside of just going to football practice or going to the game, there was nothing else I could do. But my coach, he felt really bad for me. So he went to the state to see if he can get like a little partial guardianship. So I was able to do those outings with my teammates and I was able to like go to their house and kind of, you know, leave the boys home and just come into a setting where I didn't have to feel like I didn't have like family and friends that I was used to just in that school setting. But it got to the point where I started going to their house more and more and he no longer felt like my coach. He just felt like a dad to me. He felt like, you know, piece was, of my family. Would, would, would you say that, that, that your coach was your first kind of father figure? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. What, do, what do you remember about him? Uh, what I remember about my dad was, one, he was white. He was a white man. <laughs> yeah. It was just funny because, you know, for me, it was just completely different just living with a white family, one, with me being black, and just two, uh, just a completely different spectrum, man. I just had so many di- so many different things that he taught me, so different, many different things that I had access to that I would have never had in the city. And they just opened me up to so much more in life that I never even knew was possible. Mm. And I think because of that, it just – gave me that mindset that anything's possible. Only, only thing you gotta do is just open yourself up to different things that might be available to you and just don't be that type of person that's stuck in that mindset where, you know, you should only be able to do one thing or you can't do other things in life. But uh, I mean, he was a great guy and uh, he was fun and uh, he was crazy like me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Super silly. But uh, I mean, he's just a great guy, man. It's just the fact that he, took a chance on me just, you know, is a testament to his character and the type of person that he is because they didn't have to do that. Yeah, they felt bad for me in my living situation, but I think it truly showed that they loved me and cared about me and they mm-hmm. seen something in me that they wanted to help me, you know, strive for, so. Yeah, so so did you end up um, living with them? Yes, so I ended up living okay. with them mm-hmm. and um, I stayed with them, you know, obviously through the rest of middle school, eighth, uh, seventh and eighth or eighth grade. 
and then all through high school. Mm -hmm. and, uh, when I went to college for two years at uh, Milliken University, which is not too far from Chicago, it's in Decatur, mm -hmm. Illinois. Mm -hmm. And um, I played college football for two years, tore my shoulder up, and I came back home where I still live with them. And I finished out my uh, education at UMSL. And mm -hmm. then you know, obviously I, I had a girlfriend, got engaged, and now I have my own place. But I stayed with them from pretty much 14 until I was like 25 years old. So yeah, yeah. If it was so my mom, I would have never left. Um, <laughs> So you, so you've been in St. Louis the whole time. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and so when did you like start thinking about becoming a teacher yourself? Um, I always knew I wanted to be in the uh, profession where I help people. I didn't know if it was going to be a teacher or not, but I just knew I wanted to do something where I help people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think once I got to college, um, I knew I wanted to be a teacher, but I didn't know what type of teacher I wanted to be. So uh, initially, and people don't believe me when I say this, but I wanted to be an art teacher because art was my first passion. It was my first love. I used to love to draw and just create things and do things. Uh, that was like another outlet for me. So when I went into college that first week, the football players came early. So when I met with my advisor, I'm like, you know, I want to go into education. And she was like, you know, exactly what part of education? I said, art teacher. And she asked for my portfolio. And I'm like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So she was like, you know what? how about you just do your prereqs and then we'll go from there. So I started playing college football, doing my prereqs. And I realized that, you know, I know a lot about fitness and health and, you know, it's second nature to me. I love kids. And obviously I want to be a teacher. And I went and she steered me towards the PE route, which I'm so grateful for because this is the most natural job that I think I could have ever loved and wanted to do for the rest of my life. Thank you so much. I'm, I have so many questions, but I <laughs> There's that statistic, right, of like, if there's just one person outside of your biological family that actually cares for particularly youth, I think it makes all the difference. Like the statistics of their success and their ability to like get a great education and feel way more confident about themselves just really, like really improves. Like, so it really seems like that's like the case with you. I truly believe that because, you know, you got to realize, and I think kids start to realize this too, obviously your parents are going to be there to support you and tell you that you're great at whatever you're doing, but you expect, well, you should expect that from them and you expect that from them, but I think when you hear outside of the house, you know, you don't really expect that. They don't have to do that. They don't have to say that. So once you're getting that at home and then outside of your home, I think it just creates a better person and it just pushes you to be even greater because you know you're getting it from both ends. Mm. Karen, I have a question. Um, so, I have a lot of questions, but so, okay, so you went from the foster, being in the foster system, to being in the boys' home, to being in this home where these the people became your family, and I'm wondering, like, that process between kind of being on your own, right, to all, all of a sudden, like, having, like, yeah, this unit of people, was that difficult for you to kind of make that like mental, emotional adjustment to like, I'm loved, like people love me and they it want was. me here? It really was. I think uh, in the beginning stages, I was almost trying to sabotage it, like doing stuff, acting out, I guess, just to test to see if they really love me or they're just doing it as, you know, we're going to take a chance on this kid and see what happens and if he's not good or perfect. We're going to send them back. And I did a lot of things where I got in trouble and I acted out. But, I mean, they stayed the course. They disciplined me. They showed me that they love me. They're going to be there for me no matter what. And, I mean, it even took a while for me to start calling my dad, stop calling him coach, start calling him dad, and start calling my, stop calling my mom, you know, Miss Kayser or Coach Kayser, and start calling her mom. So it definitely wow. it was a huge transition. It was a hard transition because you got to understand that my biological mother, to this day, I still don't call her mom because mm. she was her mom to me. And even, you know, my grandma, I, I called her grandma, but I never had called even one dad or mom prior to my foster parents. Hmm. That's really interesting. I have, yeah, Darian, I just, I feel like um, sometimes with kids, especially, I mean, adults too, but with kids, like our ability to just remain faithful to kids sometimes is the best gift that we could give them. Like just telling them we're not going anywhere. Like even when they try to push us away or like they're acting out just because of 
whatever's going on inside their head, like just remaining like faithful. Like, can you, can you speak to that, whether either from your personal history or just as a, as a teacher today? I think as a teacher, that's huge. And it's funny you said it because I was just talking to one of my former coworkers just about how all the times we've disciplined kids because they're acting out in class, trying to get attention or whatever it may be. But then, you know, after you discipline them, you talk to their parents and you feel like, oh, they're mad at me, they hate me. They're not gonna wanna come back to my class. You know, those next couple of times you're around them, they're giving you more love and more respect because I think deep down inside, they are testing you and they're trying to see, does he really care about me? Because if he really cared about me, he probably wouldn't discipline me. Mm-hmm. And I think the fact that I'm disciplining them and that I'm also giving them love and support, it goes a long ways because it shows them that no matter what you do, no matter what you say, I'm still going to be here. I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to support you. And we're going to be on this journey together. Mm, you know, I have a, quite a few friends, actually, who are thinking about becoming foster parents, even as single people. And I'm like, wow, I have so much respect for them. <sighs> and I actually have thought about that myself personally, too, mm. in the past. And because there's so many kids that who need really a loving parent or parents or a family. And so I've never actually, <laughs> I'm one of those that just never wanted to have my own kids. Cause I just wanted to like, look at all the kids out there. Um, so what advice would you give my friends? Like, um, especially when it's hard, I don't know. How do you gain trust? I guess even. Um, I mean, I definitely think it's hard even like right now with my situation, even knowing that I've gone through foster care and we have a beautiful three-year-old son, but it was hard for my wife and I to have kids. And we've been, you know, kind of testing waters and thinking about it, even talking about having conversations about maybe adopting or doing foster care. And I think it's just one of those things where you go into a situation and you know going in that these aren't my biological kids. So you have to get over that hump first. You know what I mean? Because until you can get over that, it's going to be hard to make a connection with that kid. So you have to go into it knowing that obviously these are not my kids, but as long as I give them that love and that support that they need and hoping that you get it back, that you can build that family unit and it'll turn into feeling like these kids have been a part of me my entire life. Mm-hmm. There is some difference. You know what I mean? I think just as long as you build that foundation with them and you just like me as a student or me as a uh, teacher, you have to build that foundation so they can buy into whatever you're trying to give to them. And as a foster parent, you, what you're trying to get them to buy in is that love and that support that you have for them. Mm-hmm. And you got to understand that as a foster child, they've probably been around the block. They've probably been in tough situations where they feel like it doesn't matter how long I live this person, I'm probably not going to be here for the long haul. So you have to get it in their minds that you love them, you care for them and that you are here for them. And that this is going to be something that we want to build on and we want to be a part of your life for the rest of our lives. Mm. I think it's a hard thing for anybody, but you just have to go into it knowing that it's going to be a hard road and you got to stick with it because mm. this is a life. This is a heart. This is somebody that has feelings and you don't want to put them in a situation where you give up on them because that can change the whole trajectory of their lives where, you know, me, it changed mine for the best, but it could have been the other way around where I'm like, no one cares about me and I'm going down the wrong path. Mm. So Darian, how long have you been a teacher? Uh, I've been te- I've been a PE teacher for six years, and then prior to being a PE teacher, I did in school suspension, and I was a paraprofessional. And so, a what? What was the last one? A-, a paraprofessional. So I worked with a lot of kids with special needs. Okay. So okay. After graduating, I was just you know trying to get my foot in the door, trying to find different jobs in school, so, so I can just gain that experience. And but just having my own class, being what I went to school for, this is I'm in my sixth year. Okay. And then so and what grades do you do you teach? Uh, kindergarten through fifth grade. <laughs> nice. So can I just say my kids are first grade and third grade. And I love our PE teacher, Mrs. Uh-huh. Wecker. I'm going to give her a shout out. Um, because she like, sh- she, she knows all the kids by names and she, she knows what the parents are doing in terms of <laughs> physical education. So last year I, w- I was doing some half marathons and stuff and she would be like talking to our kids about like my half marathons and how's your mom doing? Are you running with your mom? Like she was trying to hold them accountable. <laughs> I'm like, this is brilliant. But um, do you like, do you find like as a PE teacher, like, is it when you relate to parents, is there like kind of this special bond or? Oh my God. So, and there was one thing that I wanted to make sure that I created when, no matter where I got a job at, uh, I wanted to be a community. I wanted to get to know not only the child, but the parents, uh, that the teacher, whichever grade level teacher that is, 
I want to make sure that we're all, we were all connected. We're all on the same page because when you do that, it's easier to build that, ch that, that kid up together. So when I got the job at Crestwood, I created Crestfit. And that to me was just a culture. So when you came to PE, you know we were going to get fit. And what I did was I started doing all these different workouts with my kids, incorporating stuff that I know they love, music, dance, moves, whatever I could get them to do to buy in to PE, that's what we were doing. I wanted to make it fun for them. Then I took it a step further, and I started working teachers out after school. So that way they were getting it. They were hit. So the teachers were hearing from their students, Mr. DC, he kicked our bus today. And then the teachers were, or the kids were hearing from the uh, teachers, Mr. DC kicked our bus too. <laughs> and then I took it another step forward and I started working out parents as well. Because like I said, I wanted to build that community and I wanted parents to get a better understanding of who I was and I wanted to get to know them better. So then if they were doing something in school, or out of school, whatever it may be, I can incorporate that into my class. I can talk about it with their kids. I can ask them are they doing these different things with their families. And uh, as long as we we're all on the same page, I mean, it was just, I think it was the best thing I could have ever done because I'm so much closer to the parents, which makes me closer to the kids. And I mean, we all know what each other we're doing. You can incorporate that in your class and it's great. I, I'm starting to realize why you won the educator of the year for me. Like you're like, that's going to be above and beyond. Like really. And, See, and it's funny that you say that because to me, yeah. I feel like that, that's normal. That's what I should be doing. And I, I, I don't know why people don't, I mean, you should be doing that. I don't feel like it's going over and beyond or whatever. I just feel like that's just normal. I love it. Like, and that's like so much what a hero maker is. Like, Daria, like, that's like, well, why wouldn't anybody do this? Like, why wouldn't I start a club for parents? Or, <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. So uh, one more question, and then I'm sure Anne has more. But um, one more question is that, so when I think of like kids today, right, like I just, I want you to help us understand a little bit more about just kids today growing up and like some of the things that they're like thinking of and some of the, the things that parents need to be thinking about. Like I think when I was younger, like we didn't have like a, a lot of digital stuff. Like we weren't, you know, my, I mean, my parents were like, get outside and run around, like just go. And there wasn't, we didn't even have that temptation because we just had like Saturday morning cartoons or something. Like there wasn't even, you know, and now it's like the kids have just all these different ways that they could be, you know, just like scattered and whatever. But I'm wondering That's what the kids. Over. Sorry, go. What? My cat. I got a cat. She. <laughs> she won't leave. Sorry, I apologize. That's fine. Yeah. Did you get her? Did you get her? Oh, Did you flick her? No, she's too far. But if this light falls, it's the cat. Okay. <laughs> I want to see the cat. <laughs> no, we don't want to see the cat. We're oh, we don't want to see the cat. Okay. <laughs> I apologize. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Um, but so yeah, so Garrett, I, can you just tell us a little bit about like um, when you interact with kids, like what are some of the things that they're thinking about today? What's kind of big on their mind? And so yeah. you kind of hit it on the money. Like we didn't have a lot of electronics and things like that when we were younger. And um, I think with them, that's priority number one. But at the same time, I think as an educator, just as a parent, as an adult, you have to understand that that's the direction that us as a generation, us as a people, that's where we're going to technology is everything. So no matter what you're doing in education or in life, eventually you're going to have to incorporate technology into that. And I think, you know, with the kids now doing more stuff online, watching more TV, watching more cartoons, and just doing stuff where they're not outside being active, you as a teacher, you got to figure out how do I engage my kids? How can I use the stuff that they're always watching, the stuff that they're always doing in my lesson plans to make sure they're more engaged and that they want to do the stuff that I'm doing. And your hope is that even outside of your classroom, that they're still engaged in what you're doing and they're taking it and they're, you know, bending it around whatever they're doing at home. And that's what I try to do. Like, for example, like Fortnite, all these kids play Fortnite, you know, the video game and things like that. And one thing that I love about Fortnite is that they have a lot of different dances in there. And one of the warm ups that I do for class is we do these warm up. Uh, dances where we do the Fortnite dances and I think that just kind of breaks the ice and gets the kids going and get them motivated and excited and having fun and then you kind of trick them yeah. and then you get them doing to what you want to do <laughs> right well but, you're making it fun yes exactly yeah. you make it fun by doing stuff that they enjoy in your classroom yeah but you know just you know technology and then I think another thing is because they don't go outside as much 
and because they're not as social, a lot of times you're building social uh, social skills in class because the only time kids really talk is through a screen. A lot of kids don't really do play dates or hang out or go outside and do things. So I think it's important that you build those social skills in class. The kids need to learn how to work with each other and do teamwork and do different things where they have to actually talk to another person and express themselves. Because we talk about using integrity, being respectful, being responsible. But if you're not doing that at home with your siblings because you don't have them and you're not hanging out with your neighbors, where are you going to learn it at? So I think it's really important that teachers remember that these kids have to learn these different social skills and learn how to work with other people outside of a screen because those are the you know things that we had to do. And as a teacher, if one of my students want to be a teacher, they're going to have to learn to work with other teachers as well or other people in any kind of job setting. So those skills are essential. Mm -hmm. I love it. Well, and like there's always going to be the difficult people to work, to work with. So I think that's a skill that we all need to learn. So <laughs> um, are you, are you I, she's difficult to work with. Not, <laughs> not me. No, she's talking about the other Lori Nichols. Hypothetical <laughs> somebody else who might not be on this call. Um, wow. Thanks, Darian. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was checking out the traits of a hero and we have nine traits. And I really think the one on empathy really applies to you because it says empathy truly entering into the lives of others. Mm -hmm. And I feel like maybe, maybe I'm like stretching, but you can confirm or not, you know, like your own teachers, your social worker, your, um, your coach, they didn't go to the line of their job. They went beyond the line of their job. They weren't paid to care like that, to haul you around, you know what I mean? To pick you up, <laughs> take you to practices. So I just feel like that's amazing. And then maybe you've like taken this as well to your current role. Yes, um, so when I went to the boys' home, I talked about earlier how when I, once I got into the boys' home and out of my environment that I was in, it allowed me to shed a lot of that stuff that I thought was necessary to live in that environment while I was living. Uh, one of those things that I was able to shed was just being so tough and hard because while I grew up, you had to be that way and you weren't allowed to show your feelings because it was looked at as, as being weak. Uh, one of the things that the counselors, one of the counselors taught me at the boys' home was that it's okay to be tough. You know, there's going to be situations in life where you have to be tough and you have to push through. But at the same time, it is okay to cry. It's okay to have feelings. And it's also okay to feel the pain, the sorrow, whatever, and have empathy for others. And that's one thing that I've always carried with me because if you're not going to be able to have empathy with others, it's going to be hard for you to open up and get to know about them and allow them to get to know about you, which is going to create a better relation, a relationship where you guys can, you know, learn off of each other. But just having empathy for others, I mean, that is huge for me because it's allowed me to build so many relationships with my students, with their families, with uh, the different communities and just with so many other teachers. And I think that without that, it's going to be hard for anyone to be successful in life. You know, Darian, here on the podcast, we talk to people about like the power of their story. And once they start to share it, like as Ann says, she'll, she'll often use the phrase like, oh, people will say, oh yeah, me too. Like they start to identify more with um, people when they start sharing their story and so I, I just like, when Anne was asking you that, I just like couldn't help but thinking like, even the way that, yeah, your coach took you in, like that modeled for you. Like now the fact that now you go above and beyond, but that's just normal. Like it's normalized something that's actually rare, like in our world. I think what you're doing is a little bit rare. But let, let's hop to you being educated of the year because I want to make sure we touch on this. So did you know that you hey, were I'm going to- the what? <laughs> I'm, I'm the educator of the year. You sure. Well, yes. Good, good, congratulations. <laughs> Tell us the story. Jaren, it was before we started the podcast, you, you were saying about the story of when, <laughs> when you were on the call and you didn't know you were about to get it. But tell that story really quick about when you found out that you were um, selected. So, so I found out, so for just my district or for the state? Tell the, funny, tell the funny story. Tell the funny part. Okay, so when I was, uh, when I was, so there's a process of winning State Teacher of the Year, and it starts at the school level. So I won at my school, and then in, in my school district are a lot of amazing educators. And last year, 
uh, someone in my school won district teacher of the year. So I would have never thought in a million years that our district would even allow someone from the same school to win it again. So the morning that they presented that district teacher of the year, one, I was late getting onto the Zoom. And then once I did get onto the Zoom because I was so tired and sleepy and I just looked crazy in bed, uh, <laughs> I had my camera off. And uh, my principal was texting me, turn your camera on. And I'm like, ah. So I turned my camera on and I was on the Zoom, just obviously tired, you know, eyes glazed and everything. And that's when the, um, the former teacher of the year for our district was like, oh, and Mr. DC, you're the new teacher of the year. And I'm just like, <laughs> I woke up. <laughs> that was my coffee for the morning. It got me going, it woke me up. I was like, okay, all right now. <laughs> But the thing with that was, I didn't, so prior to becoming teacher of the year in my school, I never once even thought about the whole just state teacher of the year, national teacher of the year. That was never even on my radar. I never looked into that. I never knew who the current teacher of the year was in Missouri or anything like that. So once this process started rolling and my district was like, okay, we're going to uh, start the paperwork for you for Missouri teacher of the year. And I'm just thinking in my mind, like, okay, I feel this paperwork out, but obviously I'm not going to, you know, move on to the next level. So once we got the paperwork done, I did the essays and did all that stuff. Um, they start naming, like, you know, district teachers of the year and then, like, regional teacher of the year and things like that. And then I found that I was regional teacher of the year. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on here, but somebody's paying somebody or doing something. <laughs> I don't know how I'm continuing to move forward in this process because, like I said, I know I'm a great teacher, but there's just so many great educators. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like with me as a PE teacher, a lot of times people don't take our subject serious. Mm -hmm. And when you hear that so much, it's hard to accept that you're moving forward in a position where people always look down on it, or that's like one of the first things that gets cut when people are making budget cuts. Yeah. So even to this, to, to this day, as Missouri teacher year, it's just weird that a PE teacher for me yeah. has won that award. But yeah. with that said, so regional teacher, you know, I won that and we had a banquet and I got, to, I got to meet all the, you know, amazing regional teachers in the state of Missouri. And while we're at this banquet, it's myself, it's my superintendent, our new principal and my wife. And my wife was like looking at different people. She was like, yep, this guy is probably going to win or this woman is going to win. I'm looking like, yeah, you're right. I'm not going to win. <laughs> because these people just have so much longevity. They just have so many accomplishments. They've done so much. Like they have so much under their belt. Me as a new teacher, I'm like, there's absolutely no way. But of course, my superintendent and me thinking just he's just trying to encourage me and just, you know, whatever. He's like, DC, you got this. You're gonna win state teacher of the year. And I'm like, this dude crazy. I don't why is he saying this? He knows I'm not gonna win, obviously. So uh we were supposed to find out who the state teacher was, state teacher of the year was, I think in um like late October or something like that. But they ended up announcing it early and what happened was when they when they named the finalists for take state teachers of the year i was one of the eight finalists and then you had to interview mm -hmm. and i was so nervous and i don't i mean normally i do well in interviews but for some reason i'm just super nervous and i just knew i didn't want to let anyone down and my superintendent kept telling me i was going to win and i'm like you know whatever okay i'm just going to go into this interview in my mind i'm like you know what i know i'm not going to win but i'm just going to go into this interview and just be myself and whatever happens, happens. But as long as I know that I went in just being myself, I know I gave it my all. So mm -hmm. I went in being myself, joking, just, you know, talking to these people like they were normal. I didn't try to say something that I didn't mean or I didn't know what I was talking about. I was just being me. And when I left the interview, I felt good about it, but I knew I didn't win. And I want to say they told me that day that, okay, you'll find out in about a month or so. I was like, okay. And I was done. I'm like, oh, thank God. All this is over with. I can go on about my life now. You know, I'm glad that I was regional teacher of the year. I don't have to have any of this stress anymore. So comes the following week, um, <laughs> I was in school, and it was my second to last class of the day. And I'm about to take my, my students outside to run laps, which we normally do before uh, we get into our normal uh, class routine. And this day, my, as we're going outside the door, and I, at the time I didn't know this, there were people in the back of the school ready to surprise me. Now, I didn't know this at the time. So as I'm walking outside, my principal is running down the hall. <laughs> Stop right there. I'm like, what? what? What did I do? They were like, we got to talk to you, like upset with me. Okay. 
So the assistant principal took my kids outside. My principal called me into the office. He was like, we have all these complaints about um, someone saying that the music that you're playing in the morning for the kids when they get out of their car is like, not appropriate. So now I'm running back in my mind, like, what did I play? Like, I know the playlist is clean. I don't play anything that's wrong, too, you know, sexually explicit or anything like that. I'm like, there's no way that someone said that. So she was like, yes. And they called the superintendent, and he's upset with you, too. So now I'm like, well, I'm definitely not going to win teacher here because he's not going to tell him to let me win because I'm getting in trouble with parents here at school. So the whole time she's on that me telling me that I'm in trouble. And then she flips the conversation. She was like, and by the way, I know you've had a lot of publicity lately for winning regional teacher of the year, and you've had a few news interviews. How do you go about doing these interviews? Because I have the news coming today to interview me about COVID and kids being here. Now, really, they were there to interview me, but I didn't know that. So she was tricking me. So as we're walking back outside to get my class, you know, I'm talking to her about, you know, how to be on the news and talk. I don't know what the heck I'm talking about. I'm like, yeah, you just got to be yourself. And I see the news people there, but I'm like, okay, they're here for her because she's going to talk to them about kids being in school with COVID. But as I'm walking farther into the back of the school, I see all these people out there. And I see them holding a the sign, but it's just not clicking. Mm-hmm. I see my name on the banner, Missouri <laughs> year, but it's still not clicking. I'm just like, wait, I'm in trouble? They're, the news is here for COVID? What is going on here? Mm-hmm. And then my wife and my son runs around the corner, and my wife gives me a hug. She's crying. I'm like, oh, Lord. I just want Missouri mm-hmm. State teacher. Yeah. <laughs> and you would think that the first thought is going to be like, oh, my God, yes. But my first thought was like, I was terrified. Mm-hmm. Because I knew that winning this award wasn't just like, oh, you won an award, here's a plaque, here's a piece of paper, you're done. This is like a huge platform, and this is a huge responsibility. And I'm just like, am I the person to take mm-hmm. on this responsibility? Mm-hmm. And I've been dealing with that every day. Like, I want to make sure that I'm doing the right things, I'm saying the right things, and that once I do start as in 2021 as the teacher of the year, I'm doing all those things that I was talking about in these papers that I was writing and in my speech that I gave. And I want to make sure that I'm able to help make a change. Now, I know that it's hard to make a change in one year, but I want to make sure that I get the ball rolling. I'm a part of that process from here on out. So, you know, I was so honored and so excited to be teacher of the year. But at the end of the day, I'm still kind of afraid that that I'm not going to do what I'm really hoping that I'm able to do. Yeah. So you basically have to be perfect. Like just yeah. one year of perfection. <laughs> It's not a lot. You can do it, Darian. Like, we believe in you here. It's perfect. Okay. So, Coach, <laughs> what would you say to yourself right now? What would I say to myself right now? As you're about to, like, launch off on your, like, super important platform. Think about what you've been through in life. There is nothing ahead of you that can be harder or worse than what you've already gone through. So anything ahead of you is something that you've earned, that you worked your butt off to accomplish. And whatever happens, happens. But I know because you're such a great person, you're so motivated, you're so outgoing, and everything you do, it's in a positive manner, in such a respectful and loving manner that no matter what you do, it's going to be great. Mm, that's so good. Can you, you know what? You better send that to me. I need to listen to that. <laughs> I'm, I wake up, I'm just like... Send you the recording of yourself giving yeah. yourself. We yeah we we just had we just had somebody on the podcast um, Jay Shipman and he his dad like had this drop the mic moment where he, his dad basically said you know his he so Jay was afraid of something and his dad's like he had he had this his newspaper up and he dropped his new pa- newspaper and he said well fear is never a good reason not to do anything and then he kind of just kept writing his reading his newspaper and Jay's like, well, he didn't realize he's rocked my world. Like in that moment, like fear just shouldn't stop you from doing anything. I agree. So I'm, so I'm wondering, Darian, before we wrap up, um, oh, and I don't want you guys to miss, to, to miss this humility. Okay. So Darian, one of our hero traits is actually humility and it's, it's in there. Like you kept, it kept coming up over and over where you're like, well, I didn't think I'd win it. I was just doing what I needed to do. So don't miss that guys and we could go like another 30 minutes talking about humility but we won't um but so darian i am picturing like miss america right like you win you have your tiara you know so, you're playing the music so what are your duties now like what does that look like so as of right now everything has been kind of up in the air just with covid i know in previous years the duty of the first of the uh 
Missouri State teacher of the year is you have to go to all these different like meetings. You have to go to the state capitol and like advocate for teachers. You have to go to different colleges and give speeches. Uh, just meet with kids, meet with parents, meet with like the board of education, like anything education and student center focus. That is your job and your responsibility to make sure that you're a part of that and that you're pushing education forward in the most positive way possible. Um, I think in this day and age, you know, with private schools, with charter schools, with things like that, I know that the, the state of Missouri wants to make sure that people understand that public schools, especially in the state of Missouri, is a great thing and that we're doing everything possible to make sure that it's going to continue to be successful and push kids to be and do anything that they want, you know, in our schools. Um, I think the hardest thing for me thus far is all the extra media attention. Like, I want to teach you your local news stuff, that's great. But when you got, you know, the MSNBCs and the CBSs and all that stuff reaching out to you, you're doing these stories and Gail King's talking about you and stuff like that. It's like, what is going on here? <laughs> like, what do you, how, what I, it's just, it's a lot. It's overwhelming. And I'm one of those people, I'm a people pleaser. So I just want to make everyone happy. I want to reach and talk to everyone. And on social media, I just have so many people reaching out to me after hearing my story and I'm just trying my best to like, you know, email back, text back, Instagram back, Facebook back, this back, that back, because I don't want anyone to feel like that I'm not reaching out to them or I'm not loving, I'm not, you know, respectful of their feelings or whatever they're going through. I just want to help everybody. So. Wow, well, that's, that's a big goal. <laughs> that's a big goal. Well, we feel loved here. Oh, so let me tell you, Darian, before we wrap up, let me tell you something that my former boss told me. It, that he said, I'm going to lower the bar for you from perfection right now. He said, because I was trying to do something with excellence, because that's how I like to work. And he said, Lori, Lori, we don't, we don't need excellence. Just don't suck. And I was like, oh, good. So, okay. So it's, it's probably somewhere in the middle for you this year. Like you don't, don't do it all. Don't burn yourself out, but also <laughs> don't suck. Just like in the middle. Right? Someone told me today that as loving and caring as I am, one of the most important things that I need to learn to do is just say no. Because there's going to be times where I need to understand that there's only one me. You can't do everything. You can't be everywhere. Everywhere You can't save everyone. And that it's okay to say no. And that if they don't understand that, then that person wasn't meant to be in your life or a part of whatever you have going on anyway. So... I'm learning to say no. But I said yes to you guys. I'm so glad you didn't say no to us. Like, I, you know, it's like. <laughs> You're obviously making extremely Personal. smart decisions. That's right. I'm learning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start saying no tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> That's great. Great with us. We're fine with that. So, Darian, I, yeah, I just want you to know, like, we're cheering you on from a distance here. And, like, we'll be watching. We'll be watching education in Missouri. And we'll be, like, seeing, like, little ways it's improving. And like, I love our little education system here um, in our community, but it's, you know, I mean, when you have pe teachers who are passionate about what they do and passionate about the students, boy, you just never know like how it can impact systems and communities. So go, go, go. Like just, you know, in, and, and enjoy the year. I mean, enjoy, you know. I'm, I'm just trying to take it in, take it day yeah. by day, enjoy the whole journey, so. Okay, well, we are so grateful that you were on the podcast. And uh, we hope you guys really enjoyed this episode. Go back and listen to it again because it, it was just fun. Um, and uh, uh, if you guys like this episode, share it with other people. Give us a five-star rating and all that good stuff. And we will see you guys next time.